The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. You're listening to the Cartoonerific Podcast, classic animated cartoons with your host animator, Brian Mitchell. Welcome to Cartoon Fun, it's Cartoonerific, yeah! Well, hello, cartoon fans, and welcome to the Cartoonerific Podcast, Classic Animated Cartoons. I am Brian Mitchell, and I am the host, the host of this show. You know, the amazing thing about hand-drawn animation, and that's what we talk about here on the Cartoonerific Podcast from week to week, is its versatility. See, you can take just about any style, any style out there, and as long as you can find a way to adapt it, you can make it animate and you can create a film out of that style. The other amazing thing about hand-drawn animation is you can do animation for a couple of thousand dollars or you can do animation for millions of dollars. But the one thing I have learned is just because you have millions of dollars to do a film, if you don't have a good story, it's not going to be a very good film. Even though you might have the lavish animation, you might have the wonderful special effects, beautiful backgrounds, you might have uh, moving through artwork, have your camera moving through the artwork and stuff like that. It's going to look great, but it's probably not going to excite an audience. Now, back in the 1950s, when Tom and Jerry was being done by Hanna-Barbera, they had a budget of maybe about $60,000 per cartoon. Pretty much guessing or guesstimating. But anyway, uh, they spent time animating those cartoons. They spent time inking and painting, doing the background, shooting them on film, and then putting it out there to theaters. But when they were forced out of MGM, uh, they were let go. And they started up their own company, which was Hanna-Barbera Productions. And they ended up doing films for about a, about a tenth of that budget. So films like Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and Pixie and Dixie and Mr. Jinx. And those cartoons that they did were actually pretty funny. Just almost about as entertaining as the Tom and Jerry's they were doing. But they did it for a tenth of the budget. Well, why? Well, they found ways of executing the animation to make it still communicate with an audience. And it ended up winning an Emmy Award for Hanna-Barbera, their first television uh, show all to themselves, uh, the Huckleberry Hound show. So that goes to show you $60,000, $6,000, they were still able to make a pretty decent cartoon. Today, with all the computer technology that's out there, you can basically, as long as you have a good computer and it's fast enough, you can make a cartoon in your basement. And that, to me, is really amazing. And Ralph Bax used to say this all the time. As long as you got that box, 
you can do everything. You can do your editing, you can do your camera moves, you can do your ink and paint, you can do the whole shebang, put it together, all there in that box. Well, that's the truth. You can. And there are people that are taking advantage of that. I mean, we're doing cartoons like that here at Cartoonerific. Uh, you'll see those eventually. Uh, <laughs> but other people are doing it too. And uh, Bill Kopp has been working on a, uh, a series of animated cartoons that he's animating himself. And, and the reason why he's doing it is because you spend so much time developing shows. You could spend a year, two years. I mean, I know somebody's been developing a show for 30 years. And it hasn't gotten much further than the presentation Bible that they had. And if they really believe they have a good idea, why not just produce it instead of wasting all that time? So Bill Kopp is basically doing that because he's developed all these projects over the years that have not gone anywhere. I mean, he's developed quite a few that have, but there are many that just just sit there. And you're waiting for somebody to say, you know, yes, we will give you the money to do this. So Bill is taking it on himself to animate his own cartoons. He's found a way. Well, our next guest has worked in animation. He's been in animation since 1978. He's worked in a lot of different uh, parts of the animation process. He's even done uh, uh, worked in stop-motion animation, done a lot of different things, music videos and stuff like that. And uh, he did a graphic novel, and he wanted to take it and make it into a feature film. And he just decided to one day do it on his own at home. His name is Gene Ham. He's up next on the Cartoonerific podcast. Don't go away. Should be an interesting interview. Cartoonerific is the place to be to celebrate hand-drawn animated cartoons. The Cartoonerific podcast features interviews with the magic makers behind your favorite animated cartoons with episodes uploaded every Friday. Or visit the Cartoonerific blog featuring articles about classic cartoon animation. At the Cartoonerific Gallery, view original animation art and memorabilia from your favorite animated films and TV shows. The company store features exclusive swag from the Cartoonerific universe. And coming soon, brand new world premiere cartoons on the Cartoonerific channel. It's all here. Join the fun at www.cartoonerific.com. That's cartoon, E-R-I-F-I-C.com. It's Cartoonerific. Saving the universe one funny cartoon at a time. And now it's time for our special cartoonerific guest. Well, like I was saying before, you know, you got people that are making their own films and they're trying to do them with their home computer. And so uh, this gentleman did just that. He's he's worked in animation since 1977, 78. Uh, he's worked in different uh, different parts of the process. He's done music videos. He's worked a bunch of different places, Hanna-Barbera Studios, and, and he even worked on Gumby. So he's taught animation. Uh, he has a film that he just put out, uh, which he did basically out of, out of his apartment. It's called uh, Hell to Pay. Hell to pay, and his name is Mr. Gene Ham. Hi, Gene. How you doing today? Hi. Good to be here. <laughs> well, good. You can see I've got a, a Hell to Pay T-shirt on. I can see it. Nobody else can because it's a podcast. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. So anyway, uh, tell tell us a little bit about your history. How'd you uh, get into animation, and uh, what were you doing, and and uh, I guess we'll start at the beginning. You know, what was it, you know what prompted you to get into the animation business? Well, uh, uh, actually, I, 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 I've got a book called "How to get, How to Get a Job in Animation and Keep It," and it, 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 I kind of tell the story how I did it. I tried to get down to Hollywood three different times, and in 1968, uh, I I tried to go down there, and it was, it was, I was going to college, and uh, I went there on my Christmas vacation. And I didn't realize that on Christmas vacation, nobody would be at the studios. Right, right. So that, that was kind of a wasted trip. And then in <laughs> 1971, 
I, my, my friend Dallas McKinnon, who he was the voice of a lot of cartoons. That's uh, right. Was, Gumby. Yeah. 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 He, he, he was he Gumby was, and uh, he's the voice in uh, uh, Buzz, Disneyland. Buzz, Buzz Buzzard and, and uh, uh, Woody Woodpecker's uh, nemesis. And uh, uh, he was a lot, a lot of, he was the, the Irish Fox in uh, uh, Mary Poppins. And, and yes. The, yes. And he did, no, he, uh, in Disneyland, he was, he's the voice of the uh, prospector. Yeah, I think uh, in Big Thunder. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The runaway mine train. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well, he 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 lived in. I lived in uh, Seaside, Oregon, and he lived in Cannon Beach, just about six miles away. Wow. And he was my he was my mentor, and, and in 1971, he was going down to. I think he I think he was doing some stuff for uh, Epcot. I think he was the voice of Ben Franklin in Epcot. And so he mm-hmm. had me drive, keep him awake on I-5 going down there. And he taught me how to do cartoon voices all, all of the whole trip down wow. there. And uh, so I was down there for uh, about uh, uh, a month or so. And that introduced me. Uh, he, he introduced me to Laverne Harding, who was one of the very first uh, female animators. She, That's she right. For, uh, for uh, 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 Walter Lance. And, and, uh, and then later on, she did uh, uh, Pink Panthers. And right. she brought me down to the union, and uh, I found out about the cartoonist union, and and uh, so that was seventy one. I was dumb enough. I went back up. I didn't get a job then. They told me this is this in February, and they told me come mm-hmm. back in summer. That's when all the work is. By the time the summer rolled around, I got married, so I stayed uh, up there for seven years. Right. And then when my wife decided to to, to uh, she wanted somebody else besides me. Then I, I went down there. I thought, I got nothing to lose. I'm going to go down there. Right. And uh, I was lucky enough. And then two weeks after I was there, I got a job on Lord of the Rings for Ralph Bakshi. Uh, wow. Yeah. He was so, yeah, he was hiring everybody. To, yeah. To yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I, I yeah, <laughs> the, the whole union just swelled by about 500 members, I remember. <laughs> how, how long was that? Or did you get in at the beginning of that or? I, I was, you know, it's toward the end. I was there three months, and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, then, but that got me in the union, union, and then you're going around to different studios, right? And uh, and once you're in the union, they can't fire you. So when I got to Hanna Barbera, uh, they had me take classes at night, so they get super friends and Smurfs on the air, and they they taught me how to get uh, thirty usable drawings out of me a day. So wow. it was a great education. Very interesting. So, uh, what happened from there? You, you, did you, uh, stay with Hanna-Barbera or did you? <laughs> Actually, I led a strike against Hanna-Barbera because uh, uh, they were sending all the work overseas. And oh, so this must have been 1981, 1982, yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere I, in there. I was yeah. the leader of the Hanna-Barbera uh, unit strike. And, and, uh, so, uh, that, uh, then I went out freelancing and, and then, uh, mm-hmm. uh, then I was, I was doing a little bit of everything there, uh, you're working on short little uh, commercials and uh, industrial films. And I was doing a little bit of everything. And each thing you got hired for was uh, short enough that you didn't get bored. Like if you got on a TV series, you weren't happy about and you're, you're there for a couple of years, but, but you, you just, I had one, one after another thing coming, come one after another. It, right. it, was, it was great doing that. So you, you ended up doing some music videos, right? Around that time. Yeah. yeah. How, how'd that come about? First of all, I, th- I think when music videos came out, I, I started uh, looking in these magazines. Uh, uh, there's a drama log and there's, no- there's another one. Uh, and I just look in the back and see uh, who-, who did what music video or, or uh, you'd see who, who the-, the writers and directors and stuff. There was the, the L.A. workbook and then it became the workbook and then it became the, the-, the short. The name just kept getting shorter. Right. But basically, uh, you could go through there. And I just call everybody. I, I-, I-, I- a Xerox a thing, and I make a list, and I just call everybody on the list. I wouldn't let myself have breakfast till I'd I called a whole page full of people, or or I'd fill up a, a two weeks of interviews, and right. so that that started bringing bringing in stuff after a while. So, uh, what music videos did you do? You animated on? Uh... Uh, there was a Michael Bolton who's mostly known for Sappy's love songs. <laughs> he did one heavy metal album called uh, Everybody's Crazy. And I, I did the music video for Everybody's Crazy. It was a lot of cutout animation. And you can actually see me in the video if you go on YouTube. And I have this thing where I, I do the, the world's laziest orchestra conductor where I'm, I'm just going and moving my eyebrows. That's right. the only thing that's moving. 
Right. And they, they sped that up, and that's in the music video. I, I did Howard Jones, I'd Like to Get to Know You Well. John Carpenter's movie, uh, uh, Big Trouble Little China. Right. Uh, I, I did the music video for the title song on that one. Oh, very neat. So after doing that, I know you ended up working on Gumby. Was that right after that? or? Yeah, pretty soon after that, uh, about... About 88, 89, uh, uh, Dallas McKinnon, who was, who was doing the voice of Gumby, came down and uh, told me uh, they're, they're hiring. And, and I moved up there and, and uh, well, worked on their, uh, Gumby for two years. So that was in, I, San, in San Francisco? Yeah, well, it's right. in the, the areas in Sausalito is where we actually did it. Just, so that, just north of San, across the bridge from San Francisco. So that's where the uh, Art Cloakey, Art Cloakey Productions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How was it like? On both, both sides of the street. Uh, there, there's a school and then there's an old warehouse that, that he rented too. Wow. So how was it like working for Art Cloakey? Oh, it was great. I, I, probably the most fun I ever had working for somebody else. Right. And, and uh, I called myself the in-house freelancer. I was really tired. I, I hadn't slept for about a week because I was getting ready to move up there. And uh, uh, about the t- when I got up there, I n- I'd never done stop motion animation before. And the very first the thing the guy gives me is this chicken flying through a window. So you have to have these things on wires and you have to ping the wires and stuff. And it took me, uh, uh, I started on Monday and uh, it took me till Wednesday to get a thing done. The guy below Art was, was giving me hell saying, they should have gotten that done on, in one day. And I, I thought I was going to lose the job. Right. <laughs> and then, then on Wednesday, everybody, uh, they would have a, a, a volleyball game at, at the end of the day. Right. And one of the other guys on my my team, we both jumped up for a ball. He came down with his elbow and cracked my rib. And, Yikes! And so then I was I had no apartment in Hollywood anymore. My my rent controlled apartment was gone, and I'm up in Sausalito, and I'm out, out of work a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, and I wasn't sure if I could even get the job back. So I just went there every day, even though my rib was killing me. And they had this thing called a pencil test system where a little video thing where you could do, do some stop motion tests. Sure. And uh, so I, I was practicing on that. So where they could see me real good to uh, bust my butt to try to get get uh, back. Right. And then I, I overhear uh, the, the Lynn Stevenson, the, the editor, uh, talking that there's a, a sound reader that he quit. He had got another job. Mm-hmm. And so I can do that. So every, every time some there's something where somebody quit, I, I can do it, and I, I made myself indispensable. The, the other thing I overheard was uh, Art Cloakey was there. They couldn't get Denali to the the Mastodon to squirt water right, mm-hmm. and they tried water and it didn't look real water didn't look like water. And I remember I, I was in Big Brothers in, when I was in L.A. They were always showing us films, uh, uh, special screenings. Mm-hmm. And one of the special screenings they had was uh, uh, Curious George. Right. And the, the animator was there, and he, he showed us how he used a, a saran wrap on a wire for to make, make the fire hose effect. The, the, there's one little short Curious George that was a stop motion that I saw. Oh, okay. There, there might have been some different versions of Curious George or drawn or something. Yeah. But th- this one was stop motion. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did a test with Denali, the, the, the Mastodon. And so then I became the special effects animator. And then uh, <laughs> then I, I, I was building sets and I was building uh, uh, puppets. And, and, uh, uh, and then Dallas, Dallas came down and he said, Gene can do voices. So he brought me in the booth and I, I did voices on half the shows. And then I read soundtracks. So mm-hmm. I, I just made myself so that they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> so, so, uh, so meanwhile, uh, you're getting all this knowledge over the years of like all the different departments, all the different job things because you've animated and then you've you've done cut out animation you've done stop motion animation and uh special yeah. effects animation and editing i would imagine right yeah got into that track reading one yeah. man oh, band oh, oh. well yeah. the track reading they they had a, that was kind of funny because they had a they would do the animation and then they had this guy they hired to do the music and since the animation was just kind of uh, uh did it first he had to try to just make some kind of nebulous music. Really didn't have a beat to it. Right. So I started uh, making click tracks for the for the animators to go by until the, the guy could come along with the music. Right. And so so after I started doing that, the Gumby band had a kick ass beat. <laughs> <laughs> so so what happened after that? You you started teaching animation, right? Yeah, I, I, I taught for about on and off for about fifteen years at Academy of Art in San Francisco. Right. And uh, 
And then I also uh, worked at uh, Living Books. It was a brush offshoot of Broderbund. Mm-hmm. And uh, Living Books was uh, uh, this interactive books where you, you click on a piece of uh, artwork and it would turn into animation, a little gag would appear. So we got oh. to write our own gags and animate them and stuff. And, and that, that was a lot of fun. That's pretty neat. When were you were you animating on that stuff or were you? Or, yeah, or, I, I was I was writing gags and animating. And, wow! Uh, All right. So we got to that was fun. We got to do a little bit of everything. Right. Also, also I uh, another uh, I did a couple of video games too. Like uh, Sega, the first time uh, they were always done stuff in Japan, and the first time they did a, a thing in, in America was uh, the Dick Tracy game. Right. And uh, I, I did all the villains in the Dick Tracy game. Oh, that's uh, pretty cool. So, oh, and that, that was funny because uh, uh, they had the. I actually, I'm not lying. He literally had to draw pixel by pixel. <laughs> <laughs> and and then uh, everything was like this uh, vertical little uh, postage stamp size thing for each sprite. Right. So when he had somebody die, they couldn't lay out flat. They had to lay in a clump so they're kind of vertical. So you had to figure out different ways of having them die vertically. It, it's it's working within your limitations, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people have to learn how to do that, you know. What led you up to doing the? Uh, now you you were working on another film. You're working on uh, what is it? The Dream, the Dream Hat. Hat. Yeah. What led up to that? Basically, the plot was this: there's this village where everybody's working so hard, turning this wheel around in this factory. They don't even know what they make there, and. Uh, they were working so hard that everybody's forgotten how to dream. And this old man with a stovepipe hat comes uh, to the village and uh, he, he's, he does the dreaming for the village out of the top of his hat uh, comes a, like a little cloud of, uh, uh, and he hands them the cloud and they go home and they, they let, put their head on it for a pillow. So right. he did all the dreaming for the village. And then the little kid inherits the hat and uh, the bad guy who runs the factory, he's, he's trying to, chase the kid into the woods and get the hat back. And, mm-hmm. and that's the plot. Of, so what, what prompted you to do this? You, you had this idea, but uh, you were going to start this off in a live action thing, wasn't it? Well, or, yeah, originally it, it had a different plot as a science fiction plot. And uh, so you were, you were planning this as a live action film and it was going to be more sci-fi. But what happened was you're getting these actors to come down, I guess, you know, it was a low budget thing and the actors would come for the first day of the shoot and then just would not show up again. <laughs> yeah. 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 So since you weren't paying them, they, they, they didn't, they had no compunction to come back. Right. So I, I thought, well, man, I'm going to switch the animation because if, if my cartoon characters will run off, then I know God's trying to tell me something. Yeah. We know we're in trouble. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that, that, that's why I, I, I think I, I've been criticized for this, but, but one of, a lot of my heroes are people that are one man bands mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, that do things all by themselves. And uh, I think the myth is that uh, film is always a collaborative uh, medium. And I, s- some of the people I, I, that I really admire, they just did the whole thing themselves. Yeah. And so I just basically, I've never been been uh, shy of biting off more than I can chew. <laughs> so there, I don't know if you know this guy. Uh, I don't even know if he's still around. Uh, Mike Jitlove. Do you remember this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike, yeah, I, I, yeah Mike. I, I met him once. Yeah, yeah. He was a, he was a nice guy. Nice guy. He lived in Hollywood, and uh, yeah. he was basically producing these special effects movies uh, on a very, very low budget, but he was doing some amazing stuff. The Wizard of Speed and Time. Was the Wizard of film. Speed and Time, yeah. And he actually got some money to expand it out to a movie. And he made a movie, but it was basically, you know, he had a little bit more money, a little bit of money to play with, but he was still doing everything. He was producing and directing it and animating the special effects and doing all this stuff. I don't know, the, the person who was distributing it just kind of ran away. So... um well, you know, yeah, the, yeah, those are the kind of people I admire. I, 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 I that's why I like Bakshi uh, when I first worked for him. And, and uh, oh, and uh, and the another guy I got to work for on one film was uh, uh, Roger Corman. I worked on Battle Beyond the Stars. For, oh, for him. was that and, uh, that wasn't animated? That was a live action, wasn't no, it? That, that was uh, that was his uh, his uh, knockoff of uh, Star Wars. It was his live action. 
<laughs> How'd that and, turn uh, out? <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've ever seen it, but uh, it's, it's it's actually pretty good for. Uh, I mean, he's he's never made a movie that lost money, right? And uh, the the art director that I was working under was, was uh, James Cameron, and that that was his first film. Oh wow! And, well, you know, uh, I I was saying earlier uh, in in the intro, which uh, you you were not here for, but it's it's what you do with what you got. You know, if you got ten bucks yeah. to make a movie, you got to let creativity kind of drive it. As long as you got the equipment, you know, um, then you know you can make things work. And so, yeah, there's another yeah. one I admire is uh, Robert Rodriguez. Yes, uh, yeah, he has an excellent he has an excellent book out there. Trouble hey, without a crew. Wait, is that uh, yeah, I think that's it. And he talks about making El Mariachi. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. On basically, he borrowed a camera and he figured out a way of doing uh, dolly shots and stuff without actually having a dolly. And what we're talking about here is getting the cinematic style, the smoothness. He's trying to get the smoothness. And as he was getting the smooth smoothness into the the film to make it more professional, there are other people trying to make it more rough looking with the camera moving around all the time. <laughs> so, uh, but he did, uh, he did an amazing job with like, uh, basically, I think, I think he produced it for. Oh, Oil Mariachi. He, he yeah. did it for 7,000. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then, and then, uh, uh, it did so well at film festivals that, uh, uh, Columbia pictures decided to, uh, they were going to buy that film, and then they were going to remake it. They didn't, but they didn't remake it. They all they did was take his negative. Not they took the negative, the sixteen millimeter, and they blew it up. They yeah, just blew it yeah. up for thirty five millimeter, which yeah. uh, somehow they, you know, it worked. It worked. It yeah, gave it and, a, and 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 then the, they gave him five million dollars to do uh, Desperado, and he he uh, I think he only spent about two million on Desperado. He bought himself a house. He bought his parents a house, and then <laughs> what he had left over, then he put into the movie, and then, and then he did all the work on it. Right, the, the guy's amazing. <laughs> he is amazing. I, I think he was doing all the special effect, uh, special effects for uh, uh, Spy Kid. He did Spy Kids, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that was his own studio. He got the money to do I, it, and he set I, up. His... I loved, I loved his work ethic. Basically, when when his kids were uh, little, basically he had a, a barn. Uh, or he had a separate building that that was where he did the studio stuff but he would he would get up uh make the kids breakfast get them off to school drive them off to school uh he would he would sleep in the daytime while they're they're in school right and then then uh he he feed him he put him to bed just tell them stories and to get, get them all gone as soon as they're off to bed he had a tunnel from the house over to his studio and he <laughs> he'd go off to work all night and then he get all his stuff done with no noise. That guy, amazing man. Pretty amazing. It's amazing what you can do, you know? Yeah. As you know, yeah. as long as you got the equipment, you got the wherewithal, to do it. So so uh getting back to that film, so you you decided to just go all animation because you could control it. That's really what that was about. Yeah, basically I, I have to admit I'm a control freak. So. Well, I think <laughs> I think most animation directors are, honestly. But uh so uh, that film, you ended up doing what, 45 or 50 minutes of it? And... A 50, 52 minute long film. Right. Later on, uh, when I came on to Hell to Pay, well, that was a graphic novel. And it, it actually, it's for, you can see the graphic novel for sale on uh, Amazon. For okay. Hell to pay. And you wrote that thing. You wrote it, right? Yeah, I, I wrote and drew, drew the whole thing. And cool. basically, I did it. Uh, m most comic books are a vertical a portrait. Uh, right. Uh, Right. I did a landscape, so basically every every frame was exactly the uh, every panel was the same size, so I could blow them up and use them as, as uh, layouts. Wow, pretty pretty neat. And uh, so, so you, you you read it almost like a calendar this way. <laughs> when I read the book. So you you put that out first, and then I guess based on the success of that, was that the plan all along? To yeah, put and, out the and graphic and novel I, and then to. But, but but then I started the thing and I I briefly had an agent. She quit the business to have a, a family, right. and uh, I, I'd written a bunch of scripts. Uh, I, I did this one script uh, before I, I showed her a, a health to pay. I, I wrote it in two weeks, and then she two weeks got it done in two weeks because usually I guess it takes six months to a year for most people, and and uh, and then she then she was surprised she liked the script. 
Right. So that, but, but, well, so I wrote about four different scripts, and Hell to Pay was the one that she liked the most. And, and she said, you know, you, you should do this as a graphic novel. Uh, a lot of movies are being made from graphic novels. Do that first, and you don't have to put a bunch of money into it first. Right. And then, then I found out it was doing all right. So uh, then I, I uh, started animating. And then I was showing it to a, this, a producer who also distributes stuff down in Hollywood. Right. He was telling me that uh, films should be at least, if you're going to get them distributed, they should be about 70 minutes long. Right. So uh, so I was talking to him for a while, but I, I, it was driving me crazy. I was thinking, how I want to make this saleable, you know, but how, how can I stretch this out without ruining the story? Mm-hmm. And then I, I, I figured out how I could expand uh, some background stuff on the characters. Uh, I threw in a couple more characters. And there's, there's a, a really cool chase I've got at the end, which wasn't in the original. Right, and so, and I also threw some outtakes, uh, some fake outtakes, which should get added <laughs> another five minutes to it. At right, the end. right, and uh, so it came out to seventy-five minutes. When it was twenty-seven minutes long, it, it won a film festival in, in New York. Uh, I made it like a, a first chapter of a cliffhanger serial. Right, and then then that that encouraged me to finish the thing. And then the, when the pandemic came along, I was I was teaching via uh, Zoom, and since I was in the apartment. I, I got the thing done while I was in the apartment. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, that's how you do it. You know, you utilize your available time and get it get it done. Did you, yeah. did, you did you have friends do voices or did you? I, I know you uh, do a few voices well, for I, it. On the on the dream hat, I did all the voices, including the little kid and the mother. Uh, but but on this <laughs> one, I there's a, a couple of fellow teachers uh, where I was teaching. Uh, I had uh, uh, them do a couple other voices. I, I did. Uh, I did half the voices, and they, they did uh, 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 about well, about three or four others. Right. Wow. So, so it wouldn't all sound like me. Did you Did you record that right on the computer, or have you know? Because I, I guess people, you know, the the gist of this, and I I think what makes this really valuable for people is the fact that you know there, there's a gentleman named Bill Cop. You've probably seen him. He's on Facebook, and he has he's doing his own animated uh, cartoon show. And it's a, it's a short, you know, there are going to be a bunch of shorts, but he had gone and pitched this and he's been pitching things for years. He's had series on, I mean, Disney bought a show from him and he's had other things that he's done and he's a very funny guy, but he, uh, he basically, you know, for all the time that he spent developing all the, all that time and money, uh, basically putting into these projects and they would get to a point where people would go, Hmm, maybe. And, and then, or, or they just turn them down. And, uh, that, that has to be, I mean, I, I know it's frustrating cause I've gone through it. I've gone through development hell. That's your next movie development hell, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you, you spend all this time, money and, uh, putting things together and developing these characters and stuff. And you know, you know, if you're putting all this time and effort into it, you know it's it's something that you believe in, and uh, and then when it doesn't go anywhere, it's just like two years of your time wasted, three years of your time working on one thing. You no know, one, I know a gentleman that has been developing a project for thirty years, and he's still saying, "Oh, this thing is going to get sold," and then he's raised money to to develop the thing. And it's like, and I, I kept telling him, I said, "Why don't you just do it?" Just do one, you know? Yeah. Because for all the time that you spent into it, you cr- could have probably produced a half hour or a or motion picture or whatever. Well, so, that, that uh, sort of happened to me. Uh, my, yeah. my best friend in a, who works at Disney, I was telling him about the dream hat for him. He said, I'm sick of hearing this. Just do it or don't. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> well, that, but that's what happens. It's like, you know, you just, uh, if you believe in it, just do it. Because it, yeah. the technology is there. There's all these programs, they're not expensive. You can basically put something together, you know, between it, whether you're shooting live action or animation or whatever. You know, it's effort, but, you know, but it's going to be yours. Ultimately, yeah, yeah. you're going to own it. And then, you know, maybe it'll go viral. Maybe all of a sudden this thing will take off. Somebody will see it and go, wow, you know, let's let's do well, something. I, I, well, right now, uh, Hell to Pay is... Uh, I- it's being distributed. It's, it's streaming on three different platforms right now. It's, it's on uh, TubiTV.com right. and uh, uh, Mometu and uh, Typhoon On Demand. 
Right. How how is that model uh, working for you? Because I'm sure you know. I mean, you you spent the time to produce it. So is there any way to to generate money from that, or or they pay you quarterly? So. Uh, uh, you just you you just wait to see what comes in and and uh, I, don't, I haven't really spent a heck of a lot of money. It's just basically time. So uh, right. So uh, anything is going to be a, a bonus. And and also uh, you know you can also always uh, do uh, crowdfunding and stuff for things. But things don't have to cost a hell heck of a lot. I think I learned a lot from uh, watching people like Corman and stuff and just do a, a just have <laughs> nothing in in a budget and and right. really come up with something decent. You know, an animated film, it doesn't have to be Disney quality. It can be, you know, it could be whatever you want it to be. It could be R.O. Blackman style, or it could be your style, or, or it could be Peanuts, you know. Uh, yeah. And, you know, as long as you're telling the story, then that that's the important thing, if you're getting across the humor. So, yeah. What, yeah. what I've heard about, uh, you are talking about Bill Kopp, uh, Mm -hmm. I think I know the cartoon you're talking about. What I've read is he's using Character Animator, which is a, a basically a Adobe's a, a, a puppetry thing where yes. once you build, pull all these puppets uh, together, then uh, you can act things out, and the, and the puppet will do what you're doing. So, so that 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 does allow you to crank stuff out pretty fast. And right. uh, some of the tools I'm using, like are, are Adobe Animate, uh, and uh, they're getting some better tools. Uh, I started out, I was. <laughs> Using going to use character animator for health to pay at right. the very beginning, but it was still the they didn't have great uh, uh, tutorials and stuff on how to do it. And it, right. it, it was real complicated. So after about six shots, about, about that time, they had this lip sync function they took from character animator and put it into Adobe Animate, right? And that made everything just uh, made the difference. So I, I uh, that helped me with all my dialogue, right? Now now Adobe Animate's got some really great uh, bone tools, and so you can. Uh, so you don't have to do all the in-betweens yourself. You can you can do this, some really good extremes and right. And, uh, well, you can you can hand you can hand draw it and just manipulate it. Yeah, which is yeah. Uh, you know, hey, I'm all I'm all for that. You know, it's uh, let's use the computer technology to to really make it make it work. You know, I, but, I just like being a one man band. Oh, that's cool. So you wrote, you directed, you animated it, you did the music for it, you did the whole shebang. Yeah, and voices and so I get all the blame. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's there was a a, a producer years ago. He was with uh, Don Bluth and uh, it was Gary Goldman, and he, you know, oh, yeah. I I told I told him uh, we're talking. I was you know eighteen. I was talking with him on the phone, and I uh, said, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to do this uh, this half hour thing. He said, you know how hard a half hour thing is to do? He said, you know, a minute is a hard to do and, and make it work. And he said, you know, work on shorter stuff until you feel comfortable and then and then work larger. But I think what he was uh, referring to was not so much the story, but the animation execution. Because back then it was like, even if it was a limited animated thing, you got to do all the drawings for it. You got to take those things and transfer them onto cells and then you have to sit and paint them and then you got to bring it to a camera service and shoot it. So a minute is, it can be a lot of work when you're yeah. working like that. But the magic of the computer technology now is that it's all in, and Ralph Bakshi used to say, it's all in that box, meaning the computer. Yeah. Uh, and and it's the truth. You can do everything on that one computer. You can ink and paint. You can do all your camera moves. You can Sound do track on GarageBand. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everything. And then you put it all together in an editing tool in the uh, computer. And then you got you got your movie. Yeah, or, or your short or whatever and, you're and doing. Now, now there's distribution channels too. Uh, um, yeah. One of the things one of the things about a longer project. And, and uh, I, I learned this during the Dream Hat, mm -hmm. the first version of the Dream Hat that that's being re remade right now. You're remaking any, it, yeah, any, any, yeah. Huh? You're remaking that, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the thing was that uh, first of all, it was going to be 25 minutes long, and then it got expanded to 52 minutes long. I had storyboards for the 25 minutes, and I didn't want it to go back when I expanded. I didn't want to do all the storyboards. I already knew what I was going to do, so I didn't want to. Uh, do twice the work by storyboarding it and trying to tell myself what I'm already knew what I was going to do. Right. Uh, so, 
So my, my friend, uh, the, the one that was sick of hearing about it, <laughs> said, <laughs> said, why don't you just lay the soundtrack down? And then you'll have the whole film. So I laid the soundtrack down. I got all the voices and, and the music. Right. I didn't put the music in there, but but uh, I got all, all the voices in there. Right. And then I, I, I found my favorite scene, and I did that one first. Uh-huh. And then I did my second favorite scene. That's what. So you have after a while, you got a bunch of you got some favorite scenes, but you got a great big hole between them, and that <laughs> hole just starts bothering you. Right. And so, so then you got to fill it with some of the, your second or third favorite scene. After a while, some of the scenes that were not exciting at the beginning, which were like dialogue scenes or something, mm-hmm. weren't action scenes. Suddenly, the, they had context because of the shot before it and after it. And then they got more interesting, right? And, and uh, so the so I you can, you kind of have to fool yourself to keep yourself interested in stuff, you know, in a pro, long project. Hey, wait, yeah. Gene, where can where can people go to see uh, the uh, Hell to Pay? Well, and I th- it, it and, 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 and you know, and it's you know, it sounds like Hell to Pay, like there's <laughs> Hell to Pay, which I know that's the reason why you called it that. Uh, so it has that double meaning, but it's Hell and it's the Toupee meaning the false the, hair. The, the hair on your yeah. head. Yeah. yeah, basically it's the the world's first genetically engineered living toupee. <laughs> but but uh, so now it's you now it's on tubetv.com. Or you can stream it for free. You just have to get through some commercials. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Typhoon on Demand and Momatu. And this Saturday I'll be at the Cartoon Art Museum in in. Uh, in San Francisco, down by the the, the piers, this Saturday I'll be doing a Q and A. So if you, want to, if you want to come and ask me questions like, "What the hell were you thinking?" <laughs> <laughs> I ha- I have to say that uh, there was th- there was a Baxi film called American Pop that was screened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and when American Pop finished. Uh, somebody I knew who who is now a Disney animator, but he was going to school at uh, School of Visual Arts. He got he raised his hand because Ralph went up to the front and he was taking questions, and that's exactly what he said to him. He said, "What the hell were you thinking?" <laughs> 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 so it was funny. Anyway, thanks a lot, Gene. Uh, I wish you much success on uh, Hell to Pay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments about the podcast? Please email Brian at cartoonerific.com. Your email may be featured in one of our future shows. Hey, thank you, Gene, for that interview. Uh, Gene's film is Hell to Pay. It's T-O-U-P-E-E. It is available on Tubi, T-U-B-I. And uh, a lot of times it's available on your TV, on your smart TV, uh, or they give you the opportunity to download the app. It is free to watch. Uh, the thing that I find so inspirational about this is that to put any film together is a lot of effort. And the fact is, putting a feature film, 75 minutes of material together, where it could be somewhere around 700 to 1,000 scenes uh, put together to make that feature film is a lot of effort because you have to not only write it, you've got to record it, You have to storyboard it, animate it, color it, assemble all those scenes together, add your sound effects and all that other stuff. It's not a fast process. Uh, It takes a lot of time. So it's very inspirational to me that he was able to put this this film together in about a year. So, uh, you know, kudos to Gene for doing that. And I hope it inspires uh, uh, most of our audience out there or some of our audience to do their own project. Well, what do you know? We're at the end of another podcast. Anyway, the company store is now open and you can go over there and get your favorite cartoonerific podcast merchandise. We have t-shirts, jackets, and mugs available. And uh, every purchase helps support us here at the cartoonerific podcast and cartoonerific in general. We also have the Animation Art Gallery, where we have art from Bob Clampett, Disney, Chuck Jones, uh, a bunch of different things on there. And there's uh, always new items added every week. So check that out. I can access it on the cartoonrific.com uh, website. It's C A R 
T-O-O-N-E-R-I-F-I-C.com. Just like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, uh, a bungle of words. Anyway, I want everybody to have a great day. I want you to have an excellent week. And thank you once again for tuning in. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.